basically what I'm, what I want to do with these conversations that I'm starting to have with people is I just want other people to like meet the amazing people that I know, <laughs> you know, and I think that you're like top of that list for me. Um, I just Aww. admire who you are and how you go through the world and all the amazing things you're doing and the adventures you've been having. And I just think <laughs> other people to get to meet you. Right. So um, I wonder, can we just start talking a little bit about like, talk a little bit about growing up and like, you know, tell me about your family a bit. And I know that your family came from Somalia originally, and there's like a, there's a story there. Do you want to start with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So my parents left Somalia in the uh, late eighties as the war was kind of, um, beginning to build up and people beginning to build up. So they left as teenagers. Um, and initially they went to Italy. There's like some colonial ties there. Um, and my mom, her, her aunt isn't working in Italy. So like it made the most sense for them to go there. Um, and that's where they, they met and they got married uh, in Rome actually, in like the early nineties. Uh, and then they decided like, it was really tough to, to build a life and build a family in Italy. There weren't really like, um, opportunities for refugees to build families in Italy so they decided to come to Canada and that's where like I was born and my siblings were born. Uh, when I first arrived in Toronto my mom was telling me about like how it was really difficult but there was also like a lot of other young Somali people moving into Toronto so it was kind of and with that in Manzac around what year? My mom came in 1993. Okay. Yeah, and well, I think my dad came about a couple the time years I before. started to work in, in uh, Regent Park. It was like just kind of when I oh, started really? doing things there. Yeah, just a little bit after that. And there was a big influx of people, mm -hmm. mostly from Somalia at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of folks had the, the same issues where like it just was very difficult to settle in the places they first went. And so um, Canada was accepting refugees and so they came here. And I think a lot of folks came here too. Um, but yeah, so my parents first, I think they, they settled in the west end of the city at first, um, but then they finally got affordable housing in Regent Park. Uh, and that was a couple years later in uh, 97 or 98. Um, and that's when I was born. And so I was, my parents had moved into to Regent Park like I think a couple of months before I was born. You're literally and born so, and raised in Regent Park. <laughs> yeah, I was born in Regent Park. Um, I, I've lived in Regent Park my entire life, apart from when I went to university in Montreal for a couple of years. But um, yeah, and growing up in Regent Park was like very much, I've said this before in a lot of places, but very much a bubble for me. Um, I like almost never really left the community. Um, it was like everything we needed was really here. Mm -hmm. Everything I ever knew was really here. Um, and I was very close with my siblings as well. So honestly, I think. Regent Park for me was just, mm, how do I say this? There were definitely things that were, were difficult and or scary, but there was also like so much familiarity, so much fun and like excitement, like especially as a young person, as a child. examples of both of those things? Like what would be scary? And then what, what are the things that you're talking about that? Because I think people kind of think they know about the scary, but they never hear about the rest of it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess as for the scary, I think there was just, um, there's a lot to be worried about, a lot to be nervous. I think it was a mixture, a combination of my mom being a very like um, anxious person and caring a lot about her children and also like the very real realities of the dangers that were, that were present. Um, so like there are certain times where you would like hear gunshots or you people you knew had passed away due to violence or things like that and that was like a very scary time especially like as a, as a young person like seeing someone that he went to elementary school with and who's in your classes and then hear seeing their faces on the news like that's very that was How very heartbreaking been when when that happened for the first time oh man i was pretty young probably around like maybe 10 around then and then I think as, as I as you get older it just becomes kind of more and more um so like that was that was definitely part of it was scary um but then also like there was a lot of like I think especially in the time that like, I was very lucky and when I was growing up in Regent Park is that a lot of older people who were going from Regent Park in the 80s and 90s were now adults and they had put forward like a lot of initiatives to help mm -hmm. uh, my generation of people and I think the biggest example of that's definitely pathways like 
I can't stress enough how much Pathways helped me and my friends throughout high school and like every like all the positive things it brought me. Like the reason why I met you, Sheena. Pathways is because everybody that's watching won't necessarily know that. That's true. So Pathways is Pathways to Education. And it was a program that was started in Regent Park, I think in 2000 or 2001, um, that was made to help like Regent Park youth uh, throughout high school. So they gave us TTC tickets um, to get to school. Um, we had uh, mentoring and tutoring after school every single day if we needed it. You also had, um, what was it, SPSW? I think a student parent support worker yeah. who, um, so my SPSW was Jason and he, would always like sit down with me every week and be like, okay, what do you want? What do you need? And that's how I met you, Sheena. Like we had like on the first, I think in grade nine, we had a mentoring session and it was a crash course on filmmaking. And I just loved it. I was so interested. I was like, this is amazing. I had never thought of this as like a career or something that's possible. And a couple months after that had finished, I think I, I was speaking to Jason and he said, oh, you know, they're doing free acting lessons in Regent Park. Um, a woman who used to teach at Lloyd Dufferin is running it. And I was thinking, I don't know. I'm not really interested in acting. I'm more interested in like the behind the scenes stuff. And it convinced me to go. And like, you can see where that led me. Like it, <laughs> it was the beginning of like one of the most important relationships I've ever had in my life. So like Pathways has done so much and has opened so many doors for me. Yeah. So that well, I think is like. I would, I would even positive. say like for me, like I, cause I did a lot of work with them, like in the very early years, like when they, when I first mm -hmm. left teaching, um, I did a lot of consulting for them and yeah, I, I have so much respect for, especially early on, like what they created and like the community and the support that they were really creating and the opportunities they were giving people, you know? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, is there anything, like you tell me a little bit about school, like where did you go, which school did you go to in the community? Mm -hmm. So I went to Nelson Mandela Park Public School. It had become Nelson Mandela not too long after I start before I started um, before I was called Park Public School. Um, so yeah, Nelson Mandela was uh, honestly it wasn't that great. <laughs> it was um, it was really well. There was good and bad, like everything, I guess. There was well, first of all, the building was kind of falling apart when I was going there. It was very old. A lot of the stuff was really outdated. Before and before they did the renovation that they've done since. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, now they've done the renovation, so it's a lot nicer. But when I was there, it was like not that nice physically. Um, it was a really think, yeah. yeah. And I think also some of the teachers didn't really want to be there. I could sense that as a child that like a lot of the teachers like, really didn't want to be like in an inner city, you know, what I mean, kind of school. What do you so, mean? Like, Tell me what you mean. Be more specific. How do you um, think they viewed it? I think the teachers viewed us like the children, some of them. There were a lot of very nice teachers. There were a lot of teachers who cared very deeply. Um, but some of the teachers, I think, or what I, what I picked up um, when I was younger from them was like, they kind of saw us children as a monolith. Like they saw us as like children of refugees or immigrants who were kind of just like beyond their control. And like, there was nothing they could do about our supposed behavior. Um, you know, and I think like, uh, maybe some teachers fail to understand like where, like what home was like for a lot of people and how that translated into certain people's behaviors and why they did certain things. Um, and I can understand the frustration, but I think like as someone taking care of children, like you have a responsibility, a certain responsibility there, you know, Yep. especially yep. children going through tough times. I completely agree with you. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind yeah. of like what it was. What would you want them to, what would you have wanted them to know or would wanted them to have done differently? I think they could have used some more compassion and I think they could have used more resources. Yeah. I think there is a real lack of resources in that. I mean, it's hard because I'm like looking back as an adult now at my feelings as a child. So like, I don't know what each individual teacher was going through or maybe how they treated other kids that weren't my, you know? Yeah, but that was your experience, and the reality is our experiences shape how we view those things, right? Like, the, in terms of the mm -hmm. time, like, you know, I was a teacher at Lord Dufferin, and, and uh, yeah. I, like, I remember when I left, like, my last year that I was there, at the end of the year, about this time of year, I packed up all of the classroom, mm -hmm. and there was literally nothing left in the room. Like, there were tables and chairs and my desk, and what was on the board, like, the, 
chalkboards and things that were stuck to the wall. And that was it. Like everything else I right? So it really does speak to resources. And that was a school that had been a project school, like they call them model schools now, where they actually yeah, used it. Yeah. Um, so, and I think like my experience, I think a lot of young people that um, went there, or if you spoke to them, they, a lot of them had very positive experiences. I think that that um, like being a model school was a really helpful thing because it, it drew teachers that got those things that you're talking about but there were lots of people that didn't get to, right? And so then it's yeah. just luck of the draw as a student who you have as a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. so. And I will say that the, like, as, like, as Nelson was out of school too, there was a lot that we, we did get. Like, I remember we did ballroom dancing and like, that was so much fun. And like, I think a lot of kids didn't even get to do those. Oh my so God, I'd love like, to see that. Is there a video of that anywhere? I don't know. I don't think so. But I, we did ballroom dancing for a couple of years and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's It was cool. really, really fun. Can you still do it? I remember like how to do like the merengue and the swing, but it was very basic steps. Like it wasn't anything too. You know, like amazing fancy. swing clubs in Toronto where you can go and do swing dancing. You know, I've been thinking about that. Like I really enjoy dancing, but I'm quite bad at it. But I'm thinking like, why not? Like maybe when things open back up, I'll go and do some lessons or something. Yeah, just for the joy of dancing. You don't have to please anyone but yourself, right? Um, all right, and then you went where for high school, Amanda? So I actually oh no you were at Riverdale. No. Riverdale. Yeah, so I actually left. Um, you went east. Yeah, I went east. I went to um, right when I finished like uh, grade six. That's when the renovation started, and everyone moved to Lord Dufferin. Um, but I was having a bit of a hard time at Nelson Mandela, and I didn't want to to stay, um, I guess, in the area. And so I actually went to do a French program in the East End for middle school, and then in high school as well. Like I continued at Riverdale. Um, and that was, that was also another experience. I think it was kind of, how should I put this? Maybe like almost the opposite. The school was very nice. We had a lot of like, like nice stuff. Um, but also like it was very, how should I put this? Like to go to Riverdale, you had to be in a certain geographic area, like um, to attend because the school was full. But as, because I was doing the French program, and a lot of my friends from Legion Park were doing the French program. We were allowed to go despite not being from uh, that riding or district. Catchment, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Um, and, like, they were very, like, protective of that in a way I found strange. Like, I think it was almost a sort of gatekeeping that I found that, like, like it's like even, like, the friends I made in middle school and high school, like, some of them, like, when we'd invite them over to like our houses in Regent Park, like I'd see like their parents like following them and really like worried about them entering Regent Park. So I think like that's really kind of when I kind of understood a lot of the things about where I come from and how other people see where I come from. Right. So you, you earlier on you talked about the some of the scary things. What are the, can you describe some of the positive things that you that you you really see as part of the community? Like you talked about pathways. What are some of the other things? Like draw, draw a picture for people of what, how you see your community. Well, it's changed a lot from how I saw it as a child and it is to now. Like I'd say now a lot of the scary is gone. Like it's, it's, it's really not the same as it was. I think part of what was scary when I was younger was um, flaws in like the neighborhood design. Because everything was very closed in and there were no streets really, like there was no like, like this, it was very close off. Uh, you couldn't drive like, through. So you couldn't drive through, and so um, where was I going with this? I think that when I was younger, there were just like a lot of like um, spaces that I knew I shouldn't go into because they weren't safe for me to enter. But now that has changed. Like even like in the last, like I'd say like five or six years, that isn't really the case. Um, but like I guess the the flip side of that like the positive was is that like I knew everybody in my community like when I was young there was like a big open space in front of my building where a park was and a splash pad was and my mom could watch me walk all the way from home to Nelson Mandela right into the front doors from our window so like that was really like and we had like a, a peace garden that when I was younger it was huge like it was very big I remember playing hide and seek in there and now it's like a small little garden in front of the CRC um, Christian Resource Center. 
Yeah, I think yeah. that that sense of people looking out for each other is something that I've always really loved about the community. Like they literally, when I used to teach uh, at Lord Jeffrey, like in the old buildings were there, the bell would ring and kids would like come out of their houses and kind of run across the street to get to the school, right? And there was always a sense of like, if, if you know, your mom wasn't watching, somebody else's mom was watching. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And how, how exactly. much I admired that sense of community, you know? And I remember mm -hmm. like, when um, years ago, when there, I don't, I can't even remember what year this was now, or whether you would even have been around, but there was a blackout, like along the whole Eastern Sea. I was just going to bring that up. Oh, okay. I was really going to bring that How up. How old would you have been? I was five. That is like a particular <laughs> memory that explains exactly what you were, you were saying. Yeah. I remember that day so clearly. My mom was nine months pregnant with my youngest sibling and the power gone out and it was so hot and i remember my mom just saying like we had to take the elevators were obviously out so we had to take the stairs down and we lived on the 10th floor so we had to go all the way down my poor mom she was so pregnant <laughs> she had to go all the way down the stairs um but i just remember everybody bringing out all the like meat and stuff out of their freezers and we just like had a huge barbecue and like everyone like was just like sharing food and like all the kids were playing and i think like that was really like I've spoken about it a lot of times before, but like that's when I was like, this is my community. Even as a five-year-old, I was thinking like, this is my community. Yeah, like for people that are watching that don't know, like we know each other because we're filmmakers together. And uh, mm -hmm. one of the, my, my favorite memories from the, when we filmed season two of the web series was um, on the Wednesday night, we were filming on top of the, were you there that night? We were the filming on top of the, of the community center. And we could look out over the community. And so down below was the soccer field from Nelson Mandela. And there were like kids from all over the world, all different backgrounds, all playing soccer together. And there were these, um, I don't know if they would have been Chinese or Vietnamese women that were doing this kind of beautiful meditative dance. Yeah, and that they music was playing. And if you looked up the road, you could see in the park that the, like that food, um marketplace that they have the on market which has all the best food was happening and then they yeah. were up for the film in the park like it was just and i was mm -hmm. to me that is what region park is of course it's also those other things that you say that are scary but it's like such a uh it's so filled with life mm -hmm. as a community i agree yeah. i really agree i think people in this community have worked really hard to keep that despite all the changes I think so too. It's something I really admire. Mm -hmm. um, okay, talk. Uh, one of the questions I like to ask, um, and someone I know who's a therapist gave me this question years ago, and I love it as a question. Um, tell me five people or, or experiences that you've had. They could be good, they could be bad, what the, you choose what they are, um, that have made you who you are or that have informed who you are in the world. Mm -hmm. I think one, this one's kind of sad, but I think it was really formative for me. But I remember when I was in middle school and I had, like, I was outside of Regent, like, I didn't go to the park anymore. I was outside the community and I had made some friends and I was so happy to have made the friends I had. Um, and I remember one of my friends invited me over to her house after school. And I remember walking to her house and being, like, just shocked that people actually lived in like homes, like houses. Mm. I just remember thinking like, wow, like I thought like, I guess it never computed to me that I was like um, low income or that I was poor because everyone else I knew was the same. And we were happy. Like I never, like when I was young, I never wanted for anything really because I, I, I had most of what I needed or I felt like I had all that I needed. But I remember going to my friend's house and being like, wow wow, I think I'm poor. And I was just like, that was a really shocking experience for me. So I think that was really formative um, experience. Yeah. How did it, how did that impact you? Like in what way did it, like, I can, I completely understand that feeling like in that moment, did you carry that forward in some way for yourself? Oh yeah. I think it made me feel very small. It, it made me feel um, maybe a little inadequate. I mean, I knew the things, like the reason, like, like my life was the way it was, not through any fault of my own or through my parents. Like, they were running from a war. What could they have done, you know? So, but I think it, moving forward, I realized that, like, 
people are different from me. We have different experiences. Um, and I guess I kind of just like, especially as I went on like through Riverdale, like going to a new school, meeting even more kids who like we led very different lives for me. I think it just made me realize that I, I have differences and those differences are fine, but like they also mean I have, like my life is going to be a certain way or I'm going to have certain problems that others may not have. I think that's what I was thinking. Hmm, that's interesting. You're someone that such to me is such a rise above person, you know, like you're, you're so talented and you're so dynamic, but I, I, I completely understand that feeling for sure. What would, yeah. what would your second one be? My second one I think was um, when I moved to Montreal. And what I learned then is like, I'd always thought of myself as someone who was like before then as someone kind of introverted um and someone who like you know like to be on my own because I used to love reading a lot I mean I still do but I used to like bury my face in books and I wouldn't even go out to play at recess because I wanted to just stay in the library and read um but when I moved to Montreal and I didn't have my friends or my family or my community uh, I didn't realize how tough that was going to be for me and I realized that like I'm someone who's extremely extroverted and like needs to be around other folks mm -hmm. and I didn't realize that until I had lost it and that made moving away really, really difficult. Yeah. Um, so I think I learned a, lo a lot about myself over there. Um, and that was the biggest thing is like, I really need community. It means more to me than I ever thought it did. Um, and, you came, and you came back early so that you could live in Toronto and pursue the things that were mm -hmm. starting to develop for you here too. It's interesting, yeah, you know, exactly. I, I, went to, I went to Montreal as well. I did my teaching degree in Montreal. And I remember, like, I was older than you were because I, I had already had another degree. But I remember, because um, it was the first time I'd lived, like, away from people that I really, that were my family and my friends. And I remember feeling like um, now I'm in this situation where I have to really figure out whether I think what I think because I think it or I think what I think because everyone around me looks at things that way yeah it was very like it was very a very challenging time for me on in some of those same kind of ways and like i was mm -hmm. trying to like figure out who i was i think it was good for me too oh but, yeah me too yeah um like i don't think hard is necessarily bad do you know what i mean um but mm -hmm. i i totally get how that informed i also found it like interesting talking to you and like being in touch with you when you were when you were there because I think that it was like all of these amazing opportunities were being offered to you in Toronto, mm, yeah. like as a writer, as an actor. And, it, mm -hmm. and I don't think you were even necessarily pursuing those things. They just seemed to kind of keep coming up for you. And so yeah. in some ways the universe sort of said, Mantic, you're supposed to be here, you know? Yeah, yeah. I know. That yeah. was definitely something I had to learn. Like life just moved me back to Toronto, but I do appreciate my experiences and the people I had there as tough as like, as tough as it was, I think it was a really necessary experience. And you've gone and had some adventures since, like it has, didn't, hasn't oh, turned yeah. off. Yeah. Um, I think that's the next one. Is my it? Next, okay. uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that's my next one. So um, when I moved back to Toronto at first, I was really worried that I'd made a big mistake um, and that I was kind of giving up uh, in a sense. And I was worried that like, I just wasn't making the right choice. But then I remember something like a couple of things that happened that kind of uh, changed that. And I, one of them was that I had applied to, for a scholarship to go study over the summer in Germany. Um, and I, I got the scholarship and I was so excited because I was, didn't think I'd be able to afford to, to travel um, during my undergrad and do an exchange. So like this was such an exciting opportunity for me. But I think like even more exciting for that was uh, more exciting than that was when we had gone to see Helga and Paul in France, my sister and I, when you had set that up. That had to have been like- Explain that a little bit more. Talk about that a little bit more. So what did you do? Uh, I was studying, or what, what I was studying? No, when you went to visit, Hel like tell them who Helga and Paul are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh yes. So, so Helga and Paul are your good friends who um, you had so kindly set my sister and I, because after, after I had finished um, my studies, we stayed a couple extra weeks. Uh, my sister came to Europe too, and we had traveled. We went to France and the Netherlands. Um, and so when we were staying in France, 
Um, we stayed with your friends Halva and Paul, who welcomed us into their home, which is just so beautiful. Like they have um, basically like land where like have a farm and they take care of endangered donkeys um, and other animals. I'm jealous that I haven't gotten to go and you've been able to. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, yes. I was saying, like it was, it was magical, like literally magical. The, like their home they had like painted and designed themselves and like it was just a gorgeous array of like colors and furniture and like it was so like and we like I don't even have the words to explain it like they took so us what, around to, like, what's the feeling that goes with that like why why was that so impactful to you I think it was just like uh I learned a sense of like beauty in nature and my surroundings and meeting new people that I hadn't felt before mm -hmm. and sharing that experience like with my sister and like with Helga and Paul I think was like so special it was just like I was in awe the entire time like every like aspect of like everything we did um everywhere we went and just like the entire experience was like so like it put me at such peace that I guess I hadn't felt before like living my entire life in a big city Mm. so like I think that was like a really important moment for me to learn to like you know like to take a minute to appreciate my surroundings and also to appreciate how lucky I am and all the opportunities I've been given and all the wonderful people I've been able to meet and hopefully will continue to meet do you think that um like big picture for yourself that you're going to want to seek out um more time in the country or more time like out in nature than you have had absolutely my sister and I were talking, like, if the if it weren't for Corona, like, we were saying, should we go back? Should we go again? Like, I think, like, I guess I've never seen myself as much of, like, a, a nature person. <laughs> they yeah. have you, like, they loved having you guys. Like, they were so happy to have I know. You. It was so nice to make new friends like that. Like, it was, I can't, I don't even have the words. That I, we would love to go back. Literally love to go back. Uh, I think you're at three, are you? You have two more to go? Yes, two more to go. Um, come on, I had I had something in mind. So could you could you ask the question again? What was it like any formative moments? Yeah, so could be people, could be experiences that impact who you are and how you see the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I'll switch over to people then. Um I think someone who really like um kind of changed the way i saw myself um was my good friend corny who i met uh when i moved to montreal i've met and, her, like right she's a filmmaker yeah well. you know corny yeah and she's a filmmaker as well and like kind of when we met like i think me and corny are like so parallel to each other like i i see myself in her but i also like we're also very different, but at the same time, like, I feel like she was someone who, like, in being so similar, taught me about myself. Your kindred spirits, I think. Uh, when I first went to Montreal, like I said, I was really, like, I was kind of lost. Like, I was without friends and family in my community, which at the time I hadn't quite realized was so important to me. And so when Courtney and I met, and, like, she was from Toronto, too, and she was interested in being a filmmaker too. And we live on the same floor. And I was like, wow, like we are parallel. Like we're, <laughs> me and Courtney are the same, but different. And like, as we like grew older and like we had our like times together and like we went through so much together. Cause like I said, Montreal, like really difficult for a Montreal for multiple reasons. And like, just going through that experience together, I think like really made us bond in a very special way. And we came back to Toronto at the same time too. So I think like, I see myself in her in a lot of ways and she's someone who inspires me um, and like inspires me to like do better, but also is always someone I can come back to like whenever I need her to. And I know like we have that shared base of understanding. So I and think that was- part of Sisterhood Media as well, right? No, no, actually. She's not? I thought her name was on, on it. Oh, okay. Um, she, she is um, one of the filmmakers on the Sisterhood Media platform. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. It's great. Um, tell your great. and then we'll talk about Sisterhood Media more because I'd like to hear, like, hear more about that as well.
I think my my the next person has to be you, Tina. It oh. would just be not genuine if I didn't say like truly like you like from meeting you when I was like fifteen or sixteen years old, like you have like been my number one supporter like at all times. Like no matter like whether I was felt like I was doing enough or not enough, like you always came through with like opportunities and support and like things I didn't even know I needed. And like, not just like in my career, but also personally, like when I was really struggling a couple years ago, like you were the first person I called because I knew like you were someone I could always go to. And so like you, like I think like in terms of like becoming an adult and like growing up, you were definitely the person who was like influenced me the most. And so you know this, you already know all this, but I want everyone else to know it too. Thank you. Well, honestly, like that's, like one of the nicest compliments I could possibly have because you were like one of my favorite humans. So <laughs> oh, I'm glad. This you is really the are. truth. Seriously, really. Thank you. Um, okay, that's five. I know there's lots of other things, but let's let's yeah. let's move forward in the conversation a little bit. Like I want to um talk about I want to hear about sisterhood media. Um mm -hmm. I want to hear about you as a filmmaker. Yeah. I think like, I know I've spoken a lot about community during this entire chat, but I really think it's, like, the core of everything that I do and I am. And I think, like, Sisterhood Media, like, coming into Sisterhood Media was a reflection of that. Because when I had first heard about Sisterhood Media was, like, the way I found out about it was that the founder of Sisterhood, her name is Sama Ali. And we met because we had both been, like, young filmmakers in the city, and we had both done TIFF Next Wave. So like the Toronto International Film Festival like has a youth festival um, that they do in February every year. And they have like a committee of high schoolers that um, do it every single year. And so when I was in grade 12, I did TIFF Next Wave and I met like so many amazing people. Um, and one of those amazing people was Sama, who is just like, also another one of those people who I think of as like an adult. Like she has everything together. She has her vision. She is just like someone who like knows what she wants from life and knows exactly how to get it. And so I first came on as like a, a an intern. Um, explain over the a little bit more before you talk about what you're doing. Like explain a little bit more about what like what's the company? Like what do they do? So Sister Media started out as a production company, um, and kind of the idea was um, a production company that was for marginalized communities by marginalized communities, um, and so. They put together like a short docu series um, and also another uh, short web series, and then also I think like what kind of shifted was then like okay so there's so many people making content, so many people sharing their stories, but then also like where does that end up? Where does that go, right? Yeah. And so that's kind of the idea like where Sister Media decided okay look let's make a streaming platform where we can put all of our community's content, and like that's where Sister Media TV came in, and that's when I kind of joined the team as well. Um, so that's what Sister Media is, like a distribution uh, and production company as well. Um, so that's and what Sister Media is. And your job there is what? Like what do you, what's your focus? So I focus on acquisitions, the programs and acquisitions, um, which is like so exciting and I was so nervous to take on the role because I was like, I think you always have a little bit of that, you know, imposter syndrome where you're like, I don't know if I'm qualified for this, I don't know if I'm the right person for this. And, all that but like that i think that everyone feels like that and it's so much of it is just going recognizing the fear that that is and then going yeah. okay i'm gonna go for it anyway which i think you do all the time in everything you do you know no yeah, one exactly what you have to do. Back. <laughs> they never would they just yeah. say people perceive you as this amazing dynamic young woman that you are right oh i'm glad the faking <laughs> until you made it yeah yeah <laughs> that's what it is um but um yeah so that, that that's what sisterhood media is and like the work has been so fulfilling i know that sounds cheesy but like really that's what it has been like it's just, not like, cheesy. Working. It's what we should be striving for <laughs> all of us really yeah i think so you're right you're definitely right but um like it has just been like to, to build something with like my teammates and my coworkers, like really like that is for us and by us and like seeing the support we have, especially with like everything that has been, been happening these last few weeks. Like I think a lot of people have like shown up and shown out in a lot of ways. And like one of those ways is supporting 
um, businesses, small businesses, businesses run by black women. Um, so like seeing that support these last couple weeks has been really amazing. And also like continuing that, like, you know, it's not just like a, a, a moment, like this is something that needs to be sustained. And I think that's what like sisterhood media is about. And I think like the people who, who, who know and love what sisterhood media does and appreciate it, like they're also there as well. We'll have to share a link for sure. I'll get you to send me the, the right ones oh, to yeah. have, right? Yeah, but I, yeah, I really, like what I, I don't know, you know, a lot more than what you've talked to me about, but I've certainly gone and looked at the website and it, I think it's amazing. And I, I've actually been, when people are asking me about, you know, who, who's doing what in the city, I'm always pointing them in the direction of what you guys are doing. So yeah, it's exciting. Hey, I'm glad. And like, hard. like to, you know, to have worked with you with the Region Park Project and to see the things that you're doing now, it's like super fun to watch, you know, it's really oh, cool. I'm glad. You want to, do you want to talk a little bit more about what's been going on in the last few weeks? Oh yeah, I think it's been really tough. Like it's just like, I, I also think for me, because I also do like a, a, a lot of community work, like at my university, like um i do a lot of work against like anti-black racism on campus and so for me like this um this isn't something new or something shocking or anything like that but i think seeing it on this scale and like seeing like heartbreak on this scale exhaustion on this scale has and especially with like covid happening as well like everything's just been heightened to like unbelievable levels that it's really taken its toll and i think also like being stuck at home all day like in, in, i think kind of like what's something i feel like i have to talk about is also like what's happening here like in toronto what's happening in canada because mm -hmm. like Gina, I, i've told you before but like the amount of over policing that goes on in this community is like ridiculous yeah talk like, about that a little bit more because that, that was something you and i were talking about recently and and uh because I've been wondering what it's like in Regent Park with the whole quarantine happening and you were quite articulate about what you were seeing. Yeah, it's just been like so incredibly frustrating because like once quarantine had, had started back in March, I started noticing like I was spending a lot of time at home, but I also wanted to like, you know, look outside and go out on my balcony and all that stuff. And I was saying to my sister, I was like, isn't it crazy how much more often the cops are here? I mean, they were here very often beforehand, but like, this is just kind of crazy. And so I said to my sister, like, every time you see a cop car or you see the police in the neighborhood, let's take a picture. And like, we started doing that, I think in April. And like, just, this is just like us, what we've noticed when we happen to be looking at the window balcony. outside. When you happen my balcony. Yeah. yeah. When I happen to be there. Over 20 times, Sheena. Like, just Between by 10. 10 and 10. When, like, what would the, the dates be? I'd say probably like about mid-April to like uh, now. And when you say 20 times, what are you talking about specifically? Like you're, you're seeing them like down below on the street outside of your park? Like it's the separate times where I've seen, and it's always multiple. It's not just one cop car. It's two or three. In Regent Park? It's not one cop. <laughs> yeah. It's not one cop. It's five or six cops. I think people don't understand too, like how the difference between like where I live, which is 10 minutes away, it's a 10 minute drive. Mm -hmm. um, that if I saw police officers, how they would be dressed, that it looks very different than how you see people, police officers, when you see them in Regent Park. Do you want to talk about that a little okay. bit? Yeah. Like, first of all, the fact that they travel in packs and like they usually are in cars or like they have like their like full vest on, like they've got everything on. Um, also, like, just the way, like, I've seen them um, treat folks is very different from the experiences I've, like, heard from other people. Like, I remember it closer to, like, I think it must have been, like, around the beginning of April or mid-April. Like, um, I was going down outside through my lobby to go get some groceries, and I see five police officers talking, like, shouting at two young teenagers, saying how you're not supposed to be with people outside of your household bubble, and, like, you, like they were just like shouting at these like two teenagers and the teenagers were shouting back because they were so frustrated and upset and then I on my way to the grocery store that same day I see other cops on the other side of the street and then on my way back I see the other cops going towards another group of people and just like I feel that it doesn't happen in other places 
it, it, I, I, I completely here. Yeah, well, I was saying to you when we were talking about it that I live um, in, in basically in Leaside and along Bayview, which is there's like a stretch of stores. It's packed, like packed with people. Like I literally don't walk up the road at all during the day because I can't do it safely. Even with a mask on, I don't feel safe because there are too many people. There's no one there yelling at anybody. There's no one there ticketing people. There's no one there telling people that they're not being safe. And 10 minutes away in Regent Park, that's happening, right? And I think a lot of people don't understand that and the, the oppressiveness of that. Yeah. The impact it's, of that, right? I think that's a little hard. Like, even let's say the cops don't say anything, they don't do anything, they're not shouting at anyone or giving anyone tickets. Just their presence and self that is constant in this neighborhood is enough to keep people on edge. Or at least I feel on edge. Like, I'm just like, why are you guys constantly here? Like at all times, like I cannot go outside without seeing a police presence, a heavy police presence. Right. That's a problem. That's yeah. not right. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. I know. It's it. it I I just I, I'm very interested in your thoughts about um, defunding or reforming the police. Like what what are how do you see that? I think there's still a lot I have to learn. Um, and a lot of reading I have to do. I think a lot of people can articulate these ideas better than I do. But I think saying to, I can understand what people are veering more towards saying defunding the police. I feel like people kind of feel like they need to be baby steps. But um, I think people have to understand the police as like an entire, like as a force, as an institution, like are racist in nature, oppressive in nature. I think the prison system itself is like inhumane. And cops just feed into that. Mm -hmm. I think it's not enough to say defund the police. I think the police, I think people need to kind of open their minds and imagine a world where we don't need to force people into prisons or where we don't need police. Um, I think that people really need to listen to the folks who have spent like decades studying what it means to abolish the police, what it means to abolish prison. Like the information is out there. It exists. People have made like very digestible, bite-sized um, bits of information that people can understand by what it really means to abolish the police or to abolish prisons. And like, it's out there. The information's out there. Yeah. You just have to consume I and think learn. They need to listen to people who live in communities like Regent Park as well, and hear and really yeah. take in what you're talking about and what that that experience is like, and how it does. It has a psychological effect when you're basically being paroled by people in military gear all the time how could it exactly. not? yeah it's like exactly. the, like it's a way smaller example but like i'm always really struggle with the idea of video surveillance in schools because i think you oh, yeah. what you like like your environment you stew in the environment it has an impact on you right so mm -hmm. to me that's for you know for the little bit of help that it might give i don't think it's worth the psychological impact of surveillance of being under surveillance exactly yeah. exactly i think that's a big part of it too like Surveillance as a whole, that's another can of worms that like need to be examined, but like, you're right. So how does like things like that, like growing up in a community where you're experiencing things like that, how does that impact who you are as an artist? Hmm. I think it impacts who I am as a person and then that's kind of like my art. I feel like I, I hmm, how should I say this? Like, like I've said, like, throughout this entire thing, like, community is very central to who I am and everything I do, and I think that re re reflects in my work. I think people, like, I, like, the idea of, like, you know, found family, like, the people who you choose to have in your life, I think that's become a very important and central theme to the work I do and to my life in general and something, like, I hope to carry throughout my life as well. I think, like, that's the main way it's manifested itself in in the work i do like with sister media but also like as a writer as a creator doing whatever i do um i think that's central to it i i so connect to that as an artist that idea of found family i, I really do it, mm -hmm. it, uh it's been like when i think about like those people or those experiences that have impacted who i am that would be a big one right come being yeah. coming to regent park being sent to regent park to work there mm -hmm. was like one of the best gifts i've ever been given in my life because it's impacted 
you know, the people that I have in my life, like you, um, and, you know, many other uh, amazing young people, um, but also like the work I do, you know, both in, in my role as an educator, but also in my role as, as an artist, as a director. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting thing. And I, I love your, like the link that you make between like who you are and being an artist. Like, I think it's one of the only jobs that there are where those things are intrinsically connected to each other. It's yeah. hard. People will say to me, you know, what do you do for fun? And I'm like, everything I do, I like, I might yeah. be dealing with like complicated, hard issues with the work that I do, but like, I love what I do. Like it is who I am, right? It's hard for me to separate those things out from each other. And I think we're really lucky if we can, if we found that way of being in the world. That's why what you said earlier to me is not corny at all. It's like, no, you figure that out. And you're like, how old are you? You know, you're in, your, you're in your early 20s. <laughs> you figure that out. Like lots of people are in their 50s and haven't figured that out. So, yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about or any projects you want to share or anything before we wrap this up? Mm, I think something that I've like been kind of working on that's really exciting is that like, like you know, Sheena, like I've had a bit of a slump in the last couple months where like things just got difficult. But I think something that really helped me out of that was kind of like reconnecting with with older friends and also like working, like, getting back on my writing, um, and like kind of working on a project really that's of my own. I think up until this point in my life, I've done a lot of things working on other people's visions, and as much as I love that and how that's been so important and been such an amazing learning experience for me. I think it's high time that I work on something of my own. And so like I decided to like work on my first film that's my own that I'm writing with a friend of mine. Um, Cause like I said, like working with other people is one of the joys of doing what I do. So that's what I'm working on on my own, like working on my first film. And so, yeah. I think that's, that. that's <laughs> a fantastic goal of like doing all those other work is you learn the things you have to learn from collaborating with other people. And then hopefully mm -hmm. you get to a point where you can start to do your own work. And yeah, I'm like excited. I'm excited to see it and to, and to like be able to hopefully to get to read it soon. It's exciting. Yes, we're Thank almost done. So I work on it to you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time with me. I really appreciate it, Manduk. And it's like, you're, you're helping me out with being the first person I've done this with. So I really appreciate the conversation. Yeah, I'm so excited to do this and I hope people really enjoy. Uh, and yeah, I'm excited to see who's next too. Me too. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. 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 I'm Amanda. I long for unconditional acceptance. My heart is in my communities. I see exhaustion. My soul cries for peace of mind. And I'm